Hello, my name is John Fan, and our website, I'll give you that right off the bat, www.supernaturalhousechurch.org. That's all one word, supernaturalhousechurch.org. From Tulsa, Oklahoma, and so glad to be here. Eastern Europe has been on our hearts for so long, and this is an answered desire since I was a teenager. I want to teach you today about how Jesus taught me to hear the Father's voice. Uh, everything I'm going to share is in the Word, but it came to me through a visitation uh, with Jesus in 1986 when he appeared to me and he said, I want to teach you how to hear the Father's voice and how he speaks to people. So that's what I'm going to teach you. We've got three sessions. This is the first of three. And so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself and then about that visitation, some of the things that happened in that visitation. I want to teach you exactly what Jesus taught me that evening in Mexico in 1986. So... Let's get started by, you can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 16, and that isn't where the, the story really starts, but uh, that's something as a reference to start, because that's where we're going to be going. A little bit about myself, grew up in, in, uh, in Indiana, which is uh, Midwest of, of the United States, my wife and I have known each other since we were kids and started dating as teenagers. I'm the oldest of four children, and when I was 12 years old, my dad left our family. That left me with a hunger for, the, for a father, for a father figure. And while some of my friends, some boys my age, had dads, I would be a little jealous of them and, and look for a pattern. Uh, because my dad just walked out of our lives entirely. And I'm big, I'm two meters tall, so my mom told me later that she just treated me like I was older. But I had two little brothers and a little sister, but it meant a, a little more responsibility just because we had a little bit of land and, and a larger house, and then he just left. And so I was looking for a part uh, uh, as an example and just having a father, someone to speak into my life. And when I was 16 years old, I was born again. A friend who was Roman Catholic told me that she knew the God behind the, the liturgy. And I received Jesus as Lord. And then led my girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, to the Lord. And we've been together ever since. But that father's heart has never stopped. And one of the, the keys to my heart is Psalm 103.7. Psalm 103.7 says, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts, A-C-T-S, his actions to Israel. And there are a lot of people out there that I saw, even as a teenager, looking for the acts of God. They're looking for the manna in the wilderness. They're looking for the dramatic. I wanted to know the ways of God. I wanted to be like Moses on the mountain. I wanted to know the ways. If I know the ways that, of the Lord, then the rest of the, the things would follow, the miracles would follow. And so that desire and that hunger caused me just to, to talk to the Father. And to this day, that's the main one. He's the main one I fellowship with. Even though Jesus has appeared to me many times, and I love the Lord, and I, I talk to him and everything, but it's the Father that I fellowship with. It's the Father's heart that I have. The other thing is this, that I believed the book of Acts was normal Christianity. I just believe that I didn't have a lot of the training that others have, maybe to their disadvantage, but I believe that the book of Acts was normal. That means that I thought it was normal to see pe uh, sick people healed, to cast out demons, to see angels, the, to have the Lord appear like he did to Paul several occasions in the book of Acts. And I just thought, that okay, that's my example of what Christianity is. And I realized what I saw around me was abnormal Christianity. The book of Acts was normal what I saw around me was abnormal Christianity. And Barb and I, my wife Barb and I, grew up as teenagers once in the Lord. We grew up going to prayer meetings in homes where there was praise and worship. And the, even though there'd be teaching, the Lord really set the agenda. If, if someone was going to teach in that small group of 10, 15, 20 people and, and the worship seemed to go on, then the worship went on. There was no agenda. There was no four songs, announcements, offering, sermon, then out the door first, you know, fast. It was just let the Lord lead, let the Lord do what he wants. And now, after years in the ministry, 
we are back in home-based church. And that father's heart has never left. In 25 plus years of the traditional church in serving in various capacities, pastor, associate pastor, traveling, ministering to teens, everything in over 25 years, I began to be hungry for what the Lord was going to do next. And at the time, I worked with a ministry where I was the Canadian national director. And I happened to be in Toronto about to minister. And I'd been seeking the Father and seeking the Lord Jesus. Just where are you moving? What's, what's going on? Because it seemed like churches were drying up and, and they were just trading people, but they weren't really growing. We were, we were irrelevant to our society. There was, there was it, it just seemed like society looked as Christians as a separate little subculture. We weren't relevant. And yet in the scripture, I saw Jesus was relevant to the people. He was, uh, you know, he, he related to the people. And so there's, I was searching and searching. And in February of 2001, I was in Toronto. And during a worship service about ready to minister, suddenly Jesus appeared to me about six or seven steps away. And he came walking over to me and he said, see what I see. People running to and fro to this meeting and that, looking for the spectacular, thinking that is supernatural. But they miss the supernatural work in their midst and even in their hearts, for the process of discipleship is supernatural. And he said one other thing. He said, uh, well, he said several other things, but the main thing here is, as it was in the beginning, so it must be now, I'm moving in relationships. As it was in the beginning, so it must be now. I'm moving in relationships. So that caused me to go back to the beginning to examine how the first church turned the Roman Empire upside down inside of 250 years. And I realized from the word that everything in the New Testament, Matthew through the Revelation, was written to people in homes. The auditorium style church that we have today did not come about until the middle 300s. And some might say, well, maybe it was time for everyone to come out of homes and to move into those auditoriums. And that, that could be valid because God will fill whatever, whatever structure man gives him. God is gracious enough to move in whatever structure he's given. But the reality is the home was something God himself established with Adam, Eve, and the Lord in the garden. And so the home has always been the central place to receive the things of God and for God to move. And he's never moved out of that home. Even today, sociologists will say that it, it's the, the family unit that's the backbone of societies. And so this is returning to the way they did church. What I do is house church, home-based fellowships. And that, that visitation in February 2001 set me on a course of study. When he's, because people are running to and fro looking for the spectacular. And they miss the supernatural work of discipleship. So that's why our, our website is supernaturalhousechurch.org because it's about discipleship, discipleship first and foremost. Well, over the next several months, I studied the word. I saw that in, around the world, God is moving in home-based churches. Now as I'm speaking, the estimates are in China, there are over 200 million Chinese Christians, and they're all in house churches. We've had friends who've gone. They meet in, in the back of restaurants, in alleyways, in courtyards, in homes, all over. Anywhere two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, committed to one another committed to growing in Christ. I looked to Indonesia. I, had a, I was, used to be a Bible school director, and I had a student come, and they, and they said, the people in Indonesia grow very, very fast, not only because of the threats, because they're Christians, but because they just, they immediately begin applying the word and applying things, and they go back to their villages and in their homes, and they start churches right there in their homes. Statistically, United States uh, missions agencies have studied this, and it's well documented that Christianity is the fastest growing religion in the world, nearly 8% a year. For several years, it's 7.7, 7.8% per year. You won't hear that in the news, but 
People who study missionaries and the spread of the gospel have reported that year after year. It's 7.7, 7.8, 7.9. Somewhere close to 8% Christianity is growing. But do you know where it's growing? Home-based fellowships, where believers are free to gather together as they did, as Paul did, as Peter did, as James did. So I had concluded by October of 2001 that I did not want to pastor a church again. But I told my wife, if I ever did, it would be in our living room. And then we'd grow from there. Once we outgrew the living room, we'd spread out. She at first didn't know about that. She had to think about it and pray about it until she went back to her notes. And the Lord had spoken to her about home-based church and people ministry in our home long before he ever spoke to me. So my wife had it first. We just didn't know, didn't know what we had. And then in November of 2001, just a couple weeks after I'd made that statement, the Lord appeared to me again, also in Canada. This time I was in Edmonton. And it, again, during a worship service in a traditional church. And he came walking over. Now, this is beautiful about the Lord. I, I, I've got to add this. This church ministered to uh, a more, a rougher group of people. They had a real heart for outreach. So drug addicts, prostitutes, convicts, that's who they ministered to. And so that's who was filling the church that night. But as the Lord appeared to me, it was like the power was turned up. The pastor who was next to me just fell flat on his face. My strength left me. I fell to my knees. Three students we had with us afterwards said they were excited. They, they said, Jesus was here. Jesus was here. Did you know that? He walked right by us. For me, the strength left. And as Jesus came walking over to me, he said, I love these kinds of people. I thought that was so special. You know, there's, there's no falsehood. They've been through life. They've been through hard times. There's nothing false about them. And the Lord said, I love these kinds of people. And he came walking over to me, talking about, you know, the congregation there. He came walking over to me and he said, you've learned much from, what, from the people I've brought across your path the last few months and the word that you've studied. And I want you to start a house church and a house church network and structure it in such a way to facilitate the development of home-based churches around the world. And I said, Lord, do you have a name for it? And he said, the Church Without Walls International. And that to this day is the name of our network of home-based churches around the world uh, with the, the website of supernaturalhousechurch.org. Because we wanted to convey no walls and the supernatural element of it. He said some things, some other things, and I said, why do you want me to do this? And he said, it's against a time to come. It's a resource, a treasure, a storehouse against a time to come. So I believe in these days that we're living in, the value of relationships in Christ will become more and more important. The Roman army and empire could not stamp out home-based churches. Neither could any other regime on the face of the earth because it's individual, it's under the radar. Hallelujah. And that is guided by my love of the Father. And our network now, by the way, is around the world in, in places that it's very hard to be a Christian, in the United States, Western Europe. But twice this year, the Lord has appeared to me, twice already. Both times, he talked to me about what he's going to do in Eastern Europe. And he said that home, he used these words that house churches would explode in Eastern Europe. Your, your, your ripe ground here, Estonia, elsewhere, where this message is going right now and beyond. Hallelujah. It's Christians getting together and networking. But we do this because we hear the Father's voice we know the word, and we walk with him. Special time that we're living in. But let me go back to that time when I was first learning to hear the voice of the Father. Where I was on a, Me uh, a Mexico mission trip, a mission trip to uh, northern Mexico. And I was in a village in the mountains of Mexico. This was October 1st of 1986. I'd only seen the Lord one time before in the spring of that year. But this was a teaching visitation. I was walking on some rocky ground. I was going to speak that night in a regular church service. There was the missionary named Carl, and the interpreter that night was a lady named Dora. 
And we were going to have dinner first and then go to the, the service. And the road was very rocky. And so I was looking down because I didn't want to twist my ankle. But my spirit man was stirring. And this is important to what, what I'm going to teach over the next little bit here. To understand that we've all had uh, recognition where our mind recognizes something is happening in our spirit. Have you, have you had times like that where you felt, for instance, maybe you'll say something and you'll feel this grievance, this heaviness inside. And you think, oh, I sinned. Okay. That's your mind picking up on and, and being aware of what's happening in your spirit. And at the same time, have you, have you ever gotten up in the morning and just felt light in the inside, like your spirit is rejoicing and you don't know why, but it just, there's a rejoicing there? And your mind recognizes it. You know, you're looking around at everything you're doing in the, in the natural, getting ready, and yet in the morning you're aware that inside you're just bubbling up. So this is, this is important for a few minutes from now to understand that, because we've all done this. What happened was that my spirit man was just stirring around. Sometimes when you're nervous, we might say, I've got butterflies in my stomach. I don't know if you say that here, but that's a, you know, an expression. And it wasn't like nervousness. It was, it was just a, an excitement, and I didn't know what it was. And I was, I was just walking along and looking down. and what, It's like the presence of the Lord. It was just stronger. And it was like my spirit was excited about something, but I didn't know what. I was walking around, and, and I turned the corner because the road made a, a turn, and then it turned up again. And as I turned the corner, I heard myself say, That's, it's Jesus. And I looked up, as I said, it's Jesus, and he was standing right there. I could see the hills, the rocks. I could see Carl and Dora continuing to walk up the road. I could see all of that, the sky, the trees, everything, but Jesus was standing right there. And I was so startled. I mean, I'm about to go minister in a church service. But I looked at him and I said, what are you doing here? <laughs> because I, <laughs> here I am about to minister in his name. It's like, oh yeah, you show up. And he looked at me and he said, I'm here to meet the needs of the village. And he disappeared. And I thought about that. I, just for a second or two, and then I looked up, and he was there again. It was like he was giving me time to think. But I didn't realize until later that he was also training me in what he was about to teach me that night. And I was still, I was still, let me put it this way. When you're in the spirit, it seems so natural, you don't realize you've transitioned into the spirit. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 12 of himself, that he was in Christ 14 years ago. He says, whether in the body or not, I don't know, but was caught up into, he into paradise, into heaven. Whether in the body or not, I don't know. So that's why I reacted. Why are you here? And when he said to meet the needs of the village, it disappeared and then reappeared again, I said, Lord, it's great that you're here. There are probably sick people in the village. I won't say anything. Let me just trail behind you. I'll just follow along behind you and I'll watch you. You can go lay hands on them and, just, and I'll just learn about healing. So let me just go with you. That's just like Peter up on the mountain, on the Mount of Transfiguration with, you know, Moses and Elijah and the bright clouds. And, oh, let's build some tents and have a camp, you know, because you're, you, it seems so natural and so normal. You don't realize you're in the spirit. But when you are in that way, things of the earth just seem so foolish to follow him around. So he smiled at that. He smiled. And sometimes people wonder what Jesus looks like. He's about uh, 180 centimeters tall. He's got a long face and brown hair, and he's not handsome. He looks very average, um, it, but it's his eyes that you notice more than anything. They're very deep. In, in fact, when I uh, said to him that I'll follow you around the, uh, the village and everything, uh, and he smiled, the next thought was, I need to tell Carl and Dora that you're here. And, that's, and I literally, I went, hold on, I need to tell Carl and Dora you're here. And I started to turn to them to go, Carl, like that. And this white light came out from the Lord. And just the sky was gone, the village was gone, the houses were gone, the trees were gone. And just when I was about to go, the light went like that. And, it was, and we were just in this light. There was no ground, there was no sky, it was just light, and it was just me and Jesus. 
about three meters apart from each other. And I looked into his eyes, and I don't know how to explain this except that it happened. Standing there, looking into his eyes, I was pulled, drawn into his eyes and somehow into his mind, not bouncing around inside his brain, but pulled into his eyes and, and I was suddenly flying through space with stars and galaxies all over. And I, it was strange because I, when I'm here on the earth and I see a star, I think if I could get out there, I'd get closer. But when you're flying through space, the distances are just as big. And I was more floating as much as anything, but somehow I was in the mind of the Lord. And intuitively, I looked up to my left and up, and somehow I was searching for some place where he was not present. And out of the depths of space, my eyes were as good as I needed them to be, better than any te telescope. As far as I could see, and it was still galaxy after galaxy after galaxy, and I heard his voice like rolling waters on the, on the shore, like a, like a breaker wave coming in. And he said, I am here. Just came rolling like an echo through the galaxies. And I looked down to my right because there was no top or bottom or left or right other than how my body was oriented. And I looked down to my lower right and it was the same thing. And I, he was, I am here. Came rolling, echoing in from creation. And suddenly, I was back standing before him. I said, oh Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are the creator. You thought me up. You were worthy to be worshipped. And then it, I started to realize. I told you I was going to tell you the whole visitation. So we've got time. Because it's important. I said, you thought me up, didn't you? And he smiled. And he said, yes, I did. Do you know who the three stooges are? The three stooges are guys from early 20th or mid 20th century who were a comedy group. And they were known for hitting each other and poking each other in the eyes and doing just funny stunts that seemed so funny. Uh, slap, slapstick, you know slapstick comedy? But I looked into his eyes and I said, the fact that I like the three stooges, you put that in me, didn't you? And he smiled and he said, that's right, I did. I realized my sense of humor came from him. My love of languages came from him. And I said, that's part of what you were doing before creation ever happened, wasn't it? You were thinking me up. And he smiled and he said, that's right. He was just letting me think about these things, just very slowly, just letting me think on them. And then I realized, and I said, you spent the same amount of time on everyone who has ever lived or ever will live as you spent on me, didn't you? Thinking them up. And he smiled and he said, yes, I did. And that was before Genesis ever begins. Second Timothy 1.9 tells us that the things of Christ have been given to us before times eternal in the Greek language, before times eternal, before the world began in English is how it's worded, but I like before times eternal. It was all given us. He looked through the corridor of time. He saw our lives. My next question to him, as long as I've got the creator standing before me, that, you know, there are things, you, you think if Jesus appears to me, I'm going to ask him this or I'm going to ask him that. But the reality is the only thing that comes up are things of your spirit. To this day, all the times that I've seen Jesus. See, after this, he started through the 80s and the 90s and even to now, he would appear to me and he would say, I want to teach you about worship, how I start and shut down churches, angels and demons, different subjects. And he'd teach me for 45 or 50 minutes. And when I teach on these things, I want it to be like people have sat at the feet of Jesus because I have, because I've, I've had these amazing visitations. But this was the first one. And uh, i trying to think where I was now, <laughs> where I was going with this. But... Um, Help me out here. Where was I going? Who knows, right? Um, but um, I started thinking about 
the uh, injustices of the world. Injustices of the world. I, and again, I, I said, as long as I've got the creator standing before me, you know, I might as well ask some questions. What came up is the injustices. Now, at the time, I thought of two people. One who, was only, who claimed to be a Christian but was rather marginal, a friend of mine, a high schooler, who was born wealthy. And he claimed to be a Christian, but he lived much like the world. But he was very shallow. Do you know what I mean by shallow men, shallow women? Just shallow. And on the other hand, I thought about a lady in the church at the time that I knew who was raising two children on her own. Her name is Maria. And Maria loved the Lord, but she was a chain smoker. Because her children were crazy. They were, I was always over at their house trying to calm those two teenagers down. And she had a very difficult life, and she depended on the Lord so much, and so just took all her being to serve the Lord. And then I had my friend who was so shallow, everything came to him easy, he was born wealthy. And, he, and so I looked at the Lord, and I said, how could you do this? If it, you know, you're fair in everything. And he said, remember, all things were created by me and for me. And for everything to work properly, it has to be in me. But I looked down through the corridors of time to see the lives of both these friends. And I graced them with the strength and all that they would need according to what they would encounter in life as they depend on me. So we're each graced according to our lives and to the challenges that we face. Before the world's ever began, he built us, he constructed us to be able to handle in him whatever life throws at us. Isn't that an amazing thing? That's cool. See, when my dad left, and I suddenly had to be babysitter and part dad to, to my two brothers and my sister, there was a lot of responsibility. And there was a lot of hurt involved. My, my dad had sat across, uh, across from us four children. We were 11, 9, 7, and 5. And he sat across from us and he said, I'm divorcing your mother and I'm divorcing you kids. There won't be any birthdays, holidays, ball games, nothing. And he started a new life with, a, with another woman. Now that's long since forgiven and everything else, but it's part of my history. But the Father saw that. The Lord Jesus saw that. And in doing that, in seeing those things, they, I was constructed to be able to come to the Lord and handle whatever life threw at me. Whew, that's good. Not only that, but now in Christ, we have 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, that says that everything that pertains to life and godliness have been given to us through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue. Everything that pertains to life has been given to, you, to us. Do you know when I'm looking for a parking space, I'm driving around, I'm saying, thank you, Father, it's been given to me. Where's your provision? Reveal your provision. Simple as that. Things like that. Where's your provision? He's that intimately involved and wants to be that intimately involved. But it's been provided because he saw the driving, he saw the need for a parking space long before the earth was ever created. But everything that pertains to life and godliness have already been provided. Godliness refers to our ability to grow in him. So when he explained that to me, that both my friends have to depend 100% on him, Maria has to depend 100% on him to raise those two teenage kids, and my friend from high school, who was so shallow, has to depend 100% on him because he's been graced accordingly, been graced with shallowness. But both have to depend 100%. And so the Lord said, so see, they're equal before me. So I, oh, that makes sense. And then I thought of babies dying before they ever live a life. I thought of a, scenes that I had seen in famine areas where a nursing mother has no more milk for the baby and the mother and the baby are dying of hunger and starvation. And I asked about babies dying before their time. And he tilted his head a little bit and smiled and he said, don't you know, they're with me. And in the ages to come, they will fulfill their destinies. Whew. 
Do you mind a little rabbit trail? What we call a rabbit trail? You know, like we're going down a path and then we go down the rabbit trail? I could just go down that. What he said to me there, years later, years later I was given a tour of heaven. I know that may sound strange, but it's true. I had been praying one day in the church. I was a pastor in a traditional church at the time. And I was taken to heaven. And an angel, my angel, my guardian angel, if you will, um, it was just given to me to, to see different parts of heaven. Uh, I have a CD series about that um, but, uh, called My Heavenly Visit. But um, this part of it that relates to what Jesus said about, don't you know they're with me? In the ages to come, they will fulfill their destinies. Part of heaven, I saw angels who were a little taller than me. Most of them were taller than me. And they were standing like this, with one hand across their belly with the palm up and one hand across their chest with the palm down. And in between was a soccer ball-sized or rugby ball-sized sphere of light. And it was fuzzy light, like foggy on the outside, and it grew more dense on the inside. And the, the light was not touching, was not resting on their palms. It was hovering in between. It was floating. And the, and the angels just stood there. like Well, not quite with their feet like this, but very serious, just like this. And they were almost an arm's length apart from each other. And they were almost um, like a step behind, where you could walk between them but not much room else. And it just went row after row after row. And they're standing there. And my angel and I were walking by, and I, I wanted to, to see in there. I went, what are they holding? Every one of them had these little spheres of light. They were a little oblong. They weren't perfectly round. And about the time I thought, Father, I'd really like to know what's on the inside. My eyes were allowed to do that. And it was like I could see through the light and inside was a baby growing, like in the womb. I looked at that, and I, I looked at my angel, and before I could say, what is this? He said, he said, this is where all the miscarried and aborted babies go. And in the ages to come, they will fulfill their destinies. Whew. Hallelujah. And after that, I know I'm running out of time for this hour. But after that, I was taken to a nursery where I never saw the transition from those heavenly wombs to how they got born, so to speak. But there was a nursery with people and angels taking care of these little babies and toddlers as they continued to grow. In heaven, people grow to about 30, 35 years old, like our Lord. And even the old people, the older people look like, because I'm 52 now, it's like, okay, I'd like to look like I did when I was about 35, Lord. But the old people, all I can say is this. It's hard to describe because we don't have anything to compare. But the things that the earth caused, weight, gravity, uh, fear lines and worry lines and things like that, that's all gone. But what remains are things that wisdom and life experience have etched into a person. So while you can tell they are old, they look very young. If you were to look at them, you'd say they're 35 years old. But you could, if you look closer, you'd see the wisdom of the Lord and the life experience that they had. And you know that they are 60 or 70 or whatever years old. Yet it, the, the life of God is so strong that they appear to be in their mid-30s, yet they retain that which was valuable from this life. And as far as I know, Jesus is the only scarred body in heaven. Wow. I want to end this little bit here about heaven and get right into what Jesus... I'm taking you on my visitation. I told you I'm going to take you on my visitation. that happened October 1st, 86, but this little rabbit trail of this nursery. It consisted of a wall about three meters tall and a floor that extended out from that wall about three meters. No roof. In fact, I, w I came up on it at the end, just like this. It started right here. There's grass, there's trees, there's grass in front of it, and there's this floor, and it went on like that for almost as far as the eye could see. 
And along there, there's little tables and little rockers, little chairs and little like play pins and things like that. And angels, which d the angels that I saw do not have wings. There are winged angels around the throne, but the normal angels don't. They look similar to people, just like people. But there are also people there. And they're taking care of these little children. I didn't see any diaper pails. That was good. <laughs> no diapers in heaven. I don't know how that works. I just know we don't have the plumbing. And there's no waste. But, but they were caring. They were entertaining and playing and everything. And I thought, how wonderful that people on earth who say they have a ministry to babies and a ministry to children can continue this in heaven. And I asked, I said, why angels and why people? And he said, sometimes these children have no other family members here. So angels will watch them or people who have a heart to watch them will. And uh, it's similar because later we walked by a family and there was a little girl and a little boy playing. And the little boy was crawling over the little girl's lap. The boy was probably 12 months old or 15 months or something. And the little girl was three or four years old. And behind them and around them were all these relatives, several generations, three and four generations, but no mother and father. And as we walked by, they were sitting under a tree. They're having like a picnic. And as we walked by, I asked my angel, I said, where's the mom and dad? And he said, he said, these children were killed in a car wreck. Their parents are still on the earth. When possible, children are raised by relatives in heaven. And I said, I need chapter and verse on that. And he looked at me and said, have you not read in Ephesians 3, 14 and 15? where Paul said, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. There is but one family. It had never occurred to me. From the we look at, from heaven's point, we're one family. From earth's perspective, they're departed. We're looking forward to a reunion. But in Christ, we're all one. So the angel was like, there's just one family. So why would you not believe that the relatives will take care of the kids. They're all one family. Wow. I end this part with the nursery. I've got to tell you about the nursery. And then I go back to, to what, you know, this visitation. As we started to walk away from that nursery, and I had it clear that angels help out when family isn't there and everything, and there were people helping the little children. The grass, as I said, this is just a wall and in, in furniture and things like that, and people going back and forth. The, there was no step down to the grass. It was seamless. It was, it was just even all the way through. And so children would just run out and play in the grass and flowers and everything. But as we walked away, the grass, which was, I don't know, at least 10, maybe 20 centimeters tall in places, there was a little bit of a rustle of grass. It just... And it caught my attention. And have you ever seen, have you ever stood to the side when someone is coming up uh, a stairs or what we'd call an escalator in the West? And like if, if you're standing here and if they come up, it's like you can gradually see them come up and you see more and more and more of them. That's what happened. In the grass, I suddenly saw the top of someone's head. And I'm walking away, and, and everyone stopped. In, in that section of the nursery, everyone stopped. And, okay, this is going to be... I hadn't planned on saying this, but it's, very it's the most touching thing I've ever seen, so you just have to bear with me. Whew. Like I said, I hadn't planned on sharing this. Um, this young lady, young mother, she was that head, then hair, then arms, shoulders, torso. She was running full speed, like up a stair or up a ramp through the grass, running like this with her hands out. And I, I drew a line with my eye. What is she running to coming up out of the grass like that? Because everyone was stopped. Everyone else knew what was going on. They knew by the spirit, evidently. You know, I was just allowed to, to watch it develop, watch it happen. And there was an angel who was holding a little baby and a little newborn. And at that point, the, ba the angel had his back turned to me. 
but it, in perfectly synchronized timing. As she ran and came to the angel, he put the baby out like that. And that, that mother just took her child, and just spun around. She died either in childbirth or after childbirth. I don't know how, but it was shortly after she gave birth. And all she cared about was her baby. It was just, it was so touching. It was just so powerful. Ah, sorry about that. It's the most touching thing that I, I saw in heaven. It was just amazing, the, the goodness of the Lord. So all of that leads back to Jesus standing there in October of 86 when I thought of babies dying before their time. And how could you do that? That's why I told him, how could you do that? And he said, don't you know, they're with me. And in the ages to come, they will fulfill their destinies. Little children grow up. They'll be given a choice, like everybody else. Whoo, hallelujah. So after this, the Lord said, I want to teach you how to hear the voice of the Father, how he speaks to people. And he disappeared. All of that to think about. And so I turned the corner. He, was, he had been standing kind of an elbow of the road. And so I turned the corner and I looked up and he's standing there again, just, just like that. And he said, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And he, he half recited and half told me. But, so I'll tell it to you. It's Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a rich man, evidently a very ungodly rich man, and a beggar named Lazarus. The beggar was full of sores, and friends evidently carried him to the gate of the rich man's house, and all he wanted was a few scraps, just the garbage to eat. And it says here that, that the dogs came and lick, licked this man's sores. So he was an invalid. But over the course of time, both men died. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, or paradise, and the rich man ended up in hell. Now, I've got to explain this, because people read the scriptures and they don't explain it, but my heart is to always explain. At the time in the earth, there were two compartments. Paradise, or Abraham's bosom, is how the Jews believed. And they believed paradise to be park-like. Trees, grass, hills, water, etc. A place of comfort. Why was paradise, or why was Abraham's bosom necessary? It was for the righteous dead who were waiting for Jesus to die on the cross to pay for their sins. Once their sins were paid for, they could be carried off into heaven. But at the time, there's two compartments in the earth. Do you remember, excuse me, um, Ephesians 4 and verse 8, 7 and 8, where it says, in that Jesus died, uh, it says that he descended into the lower parts of the earth. That's plural, parts of the earth. That's what it's talking about. Jesus descended into both paradise and hell. Peter tells us he told the, the people who were alive in Noah's time that, you know, he was, he was the real ark. So at the time, there's two, two places. Do you remember again in Ephesians 4, 8, it said Jesus, when he arose, led captivity captive. What that's a reference to, and we, we don't understand it, it's, doesn't, it's not explained very often. Captivity were those who were held captive in, in paradise or in Abraham's bosom. They were held captive waiting for the, for the redemption of their of their sins, of redemption of their, uh, you know, paying for their sins. So when Jesus was resurrected, he took paradise up into heaven. He took the people who had been waiting up into heaven. That's why Paul said he was caught up into paradise in 2 Corinthians 12. I hope I wasn't too confusing. There were two compartments in the earth at the time, paradise and hell. Now there's only one, hell. It's a holding place. It's a waiting place for the final day. For us now, we go right to heaven. We don't have to wait in the heart of the earth in a holding place, in a nice holding place. We go straight to heaven. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But what Jesus pointed out to me is this. Both men went to their respective places. And notice what it says here in the text. Of the, of the rich man who was not a believer, 
In verse 24, he says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he can even dip just the tip of his finger in water and bring it to me because I'm tormented in this flame. What the Lord pointed out in this visitation is this. He said, notice both men died. Their bodies were buried on the earth. So we can see that all the senses, all the physical senses are still in operation even though these guys are in the heart of the earth. And they could see one another. They heard one another. He wanted the taste of water. And when the Lord said that, when he said uh, that the, the spirit man is the root of your physical senses, he said that you have to, this is what he told me, you have to train yourself to continually switch your attention between your physical senses and your spirit man's senses. And he said, you are already doing this. You've got to understand, it is the spirit man where the Lord speaks. It's the spirit man, and in those senses, where we hear the voice of God, where we receive impressions from the, from the Lord. It's in our spirit man. So th we have, you know what I mean by teeter-totter? Yeah, a child's playground toy. In the middle of that teeter-totter is your mind. And on one end is your spirit, and on the other end is your physical senses. And our mind has to continually switch back and forth between physical senses and spiritual senses. Jesus used two examples of, from Scripture, from his own life, uh, to teach me about this. He said, it's in Luke chapter 8, and if you look at Luke chapter 8, and verse 46... And we do this all the time and you don't realize it. If, if you sin and you think, oh, I shouldn't have said that, and then you feel a grievance in your spirit, you're doing exactly what Jesus said to do. Your mind is switching the focus to become aware of what's happening in your spirit. What he told me is this. He said, he said John, he said, when you're in a service or... Uh, in a meeting, and you receive a word, or you can tell which direction the service is going to go, or where the anointing is, how do you do that? And I had to think for a minute, and I thought, well, I, I told him, I said, sometimes I shut my eyes. He said, exactly, you shut your eyes so you can concentrate on your spirit man. He said, said when, you prof when you first began prophesying, did you do it with your eyes open or closed? I said, closed. And he let me answer my own question, why? to shut out the physical senses so I can concentrate on my spirit man. Have you ever gone to a store and that store has a heaviness around it? Like the atmosphere in that store is dark and you, you, physically you look around with your eyes, you hear what's going on, but something just doesn't feel right. Maybe it's the clerk, maybe it's the owner. How about parts of town? Are there parts of town that not just physically, but in your spirit, just feel more oppressed. See, you're switching back and forth between your spiritual senses and your physical senses. That is the key to hearing the voice of the Lord. This is the key to do this, to train yourself to do this. And the example Jesus used it was in Luke 8, 46. He referred to two instances in his own life during this visitation. This was on his way to Jairus' house. Uh, Jairus' daughter had died, and a woman with a hemorrhaging issue uh, pressed through the crowd. Everyone was pressing on him, and she pressed through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. And in Luke 8, 46, he says, somebody has touched me because I perceive that power has gone out of me. Now, earlier, the previous verse, he said, okay, who touched me? And they said, master, look at the crowd. Everybody's touching you. How can you ask that? He said, no, no, I perceive, someone touched me, I perceive power has gone out of me. So what he told me in this visitation, he said, I was aware. As much as I could hear and smell and see the crowd around me and pressing and jostling and feel them jostling against me, my mind was in my spirit and I felt the power go when she touched the hem of my garment. And he said, you have to train yourself that same way. Isn't that amazing? A friend of mine uh, from college was, told me that 
he was about to go party with some friends. And he put his hand on the door, and he heard, they're going to have a wreck. Don't go. And it caused him to pull his hand back. I'm going to use that example in the next hour, or the one after that, to talk about the way, different ways the Lord speaks to us. But in his physical senses, he was going to go out with the guys. But when he touched that, he heard that. Don't go. They're going to have a wreck. And so he didn't. He said, I'm not going to go with you. And they did have a wreck. I think one of his friends was killed in that wreck. And many times we'll have something like, uh, this, this also happens when a friend that we haven't uh, heard from in a long time crosses our mind. You ever have that where somebody's just on your mind all week long? And you think, what is that? And then you'll see them a week later or two weeks later. And, and you say, you know, I was thinking about you uh, week, last week or two. Is everything Okay. Oh, wow, that was a rough week. Thank you for praying for me. And you go, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> and what you really mean is, I was not smart enough to recognize that was God putting you on my heart to pray for you, but I'll remember next time. I've done that. It took me a while, it took me a few times before I recognized that was the Holy Spirit. Well, what was happening? In my mind, you know, physical sense is fine, but in my mind, just kind of floating up out of my spirit, would be my friend's name. I wonder what's going on with so-and-so. That is, that is the Lord placing that in your spirit and you being aware of your spirit man's senses. This is how people hear angels. This is how people smell the aroma of the Lord sometimes in meetings. It's not their physical nose or their physical ear. It's their spirit man's nose and ear. Because if, you're, if our bodies were to die right now, our spirit and soul occupy the same space. Our bodies, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19, are temples of God. But our spirit and soul occupy the same space. So my spirit man's ears are in the same space as my physical man's ears. My spirit man's eyes are in the same space. That's why I can see with the physical, but when the Lord opens my eyes to the spirit realm, then I can also see in his realm at the same time. It's not that I'm trying to do it, it's just, it just happens. Both spirit man and natural man's senses coincide. Oh, we're just getting started. So many examples to use, but you can probably think of your own examples where you have walked into a store and felt heaviness, or you contemplate, maybe I'm going to go do this and do that, and you say, it just doesn't feel right. That's your spirit man's senses. Or you look at a friend, and on the outside, the friend seems cheerful enough. They're dressed properly. But on the inside, in your mind, you switch on that teeter-totter. You switch to your spirit man. And you say, you know, they're just depressed or in strife or something isn't quite right. Anybody ever have that happen? Yeah. That is, you're already doing it. You're already looking to your spirit man's senses. So, our time is out for this session. But let me say a quick prayer because uh, not everybody may be able to get all three, although I hope they do, but I always pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for everybody who's listening and watching this right now, and I ask that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that you would continue to show them things that they've never seen before. And we praise you and we thank you for doing it, Father God, to quicken it. And I ask for you to just touch your hand for healing, to give understanding. There's people out there who thought that you've never spoken to them, and yet all along you were putting things in their spirit so they could feel that, so they could sense that. Father God, that they would just know that. If you're listening to me and watching me right now, uh, and that's you, that you've thought that God has forgotten you and that he's never spoken to you, and yet these examples that I'm using find out that he has been speaking to you all along. Now, I'm going to get into the specifics in the next hour, so uh, stay tuned. But let you know, you're not alone. The Lord has been speaking to you. You are spiritually sensitive, more so than you realize. God bless. We'll see you next time. John Fenn, SupernaturalHouseChurch.org.